Hello, and welcome to Linux Lads, episode 111. Joining me today is Mike. Say hello, Mike. Hello, hello. And Shane and Connor are unavailable to record today. I think Mike and I are going to first talk about how we interact with news in general. Any kind of news, whether that's like YouTube or newspapers or whatever. How do you keep up with things? That really depends on the kind of news. So technical news, uh, mostly a, uh, a news reader app on my, uh, uh, on my uh, phone. I use Nextcloud as a news aggregator and the app just pulls it from the Nextcloud server. I should have been prepared and I should be able to tell you what it is. I'm just quickly, ex- absolutely not checking my phone. It's called Next News. I know it as the blue, blue white icon, second from the bottom, second from the left. If, we, if, if anybody moved my icons around on my phone, I'd be, I'd be fucked. <laughs> uh, anyway, it's, it's, um, it's called Next News. It's a decent app that, uh, it's an iOS client for Next Cloud News. And I get, I'm ashamed to say, I get the feed from the uh, glorious Orange website. Uh, it's just because I don't really read many articles. I just read the headlines, right? So I have, I have like a ticker that I, that I take, I take the phone out and I see what's happening in the world. I, most of the time don't read the comments because that would just annoy me. Uh, but I do see, you know, if I want to see what's happening, usually it's a link to like an article. I also, uh, I get the links from, uh, Y Combinator, well, from Hacker News, obviously. Uh, Dan from, uh, all the other one, the, Lobsters. Uh, Ars Technica. Oh, okay. Uh, no, actually, no, I don't do lobster. I always want to go on lobsters and set it up and it never works out. Uh, I never, f- for some reason, whenever I want to remember to do that, I'm not at the computer or not in the mood to, to set things up. Anyway, so. That's one thing, and I get so that's the technical news. And increasingly, I get a lot of news coming from Mastodon, from my Fedi account, where uh, people just mention something. As for like non-technical news, uh, I have a student because I'm a student, so I get a free subscription to the application version of the, a digital version of the Irish Times. So that's an app. Again, I mostly read a not- notification that it sends. Uh, notes to my phone. Uh, so I, I basically get the headlines. If something interesting is happening, I click and read it. And I subscribe to The Economist. So that gives me news plus, uh, obviously, it's more articles. But as a podcast, well, it's I get the app and I get the articles by listening to it. And oh, and yeah, YouTube, obviously. And then podcast for Linux. Uh, and uh, I think that's it, basically. It really depends on what uh, what thing. And then I think, yeah, the only thing I don't do is uh, like actually watch the telly. I don't actually watch evening news, which was a massive fixture for the first 20 years of my life or so. As far as I remember, basically, that was the thing where the whole family sits down and criticize, criticizes <laughs> whatever's happening. You know, that's the that's the one thing. That's the one. If, if he couldn't make the dinner, then he always, almost always made the evening news. Mm-hmm. And uh, it just does, that's no longer a thing. So what about you? How does the, how do you deal with information consumption. I subscribe to way too many RSS feeds. I think I go through my RSS feeds periodically. It's, I guess it's sort of become a habit. I pop over to my first tab. It's a pinned tab. And it's, it's uh, YAR, Y-A-R-R, stands for yet another RSS reader. And I've been using it for over, over two years, maybe over three years. I don't know. A while. And I really like it. It, ha- it has all the features I want and nothing that I don't. It even has, it's, it's like a readability integration or something. It, it, from what I remember, it uses the same library that powers Firefox's reader mode. So when you open a feed and that particular news item only includes the link to the post like if you're reading lobsters or hacker news or something then it's only going to say like i have a link for comments well i can press the i key or click the read here button and it fetches the contents of that actual blog post from the website it goes to the source link and then pulls all the data into my reader so some rss feeds only include a summary and they're like hey read the rest of this on our website where we can show you ads and all this other crap well the readability feature of yar mitigates that and it's really nice it also has vim key bindings so i can power <laughs> through all my news using just hjknl yeah that sounds right so you you read you consume news 
predominantly on your on your like on your computer rather than your phone. Yes, the it is like responsive on mobile, but the experience isn't great, and I don't think I would really enjoy that anyway. I primarily read news on my computer using the self-hosted thing. There are sometimes articles that are long that I want to read without skimming and like I want to take time to fully absorb the information and digest it. For those, I use a service called Wallabag, which is sort of like an open source and self-hosted pocket. It downloads the article contents, saves it so I can read it later, but my e-reader integrates with Wallabag so I can download all of those articles and read them on a nice e-ink display sitting in the armchair with a cup of coffee or tea or something. And it's it's really pleasant. Yeah, I can't imagine that. So that sounds really sophisticated. Uh, <laughs> I I just I just basically pull out my phone and look at the screen and uh, I checked what what I have in my feed reader. So for some reason I have like six different feeds from Ars Technica. I don't understand why. There must there's repetition. I noticed. I always like, did I read this headline already? <laughs> you know, scratching my head. Yes, I did. And then I read it again when somebody posted on Mastodon because I'm pretty sure. Yeah, never mind. So so Ars Technica. Um, Hacker News, OMG Linux, U- Euractive, I think that's how you, it's a, it's a European uh, news feed, uh, OMG Ubuntu, GSM Arena, that's for work, Poronix, Hackaday Block, uh, Gaming on Linux, It's Foss, and there are some things that I know, think no longer are active. And that's, that's not that many actually. Uh, I can't say that I have one news source that I would, I don't go to websites, like, except for, well, actually, no, I don't, like, you know how you might choose to, the same way people used to go and buy specifically a newspaper from, from a kiosk and bring it home and read it over. You could, people usually probably just pick up an app and read the whole application uh, worth of news or a website, like you might go on the Guardian's website or so whatever periodic you, you, you use, do you? But I don't ever do that almost. I never pick up like a, uh, news medium and try to consume it without without seeing the headlines first. It's it's for me. It's just a list of headlines. Everything. I don't know mm-hmm. if that makes any sense. That does make sense. I scroll through headlines too, but I do often read the actual content on on the articles. Mm-hmm. Is is there any news source that you would recommend specifically for tech news? Dang! I just counted the number of feeds I'm subscribed to. One hundred and one. <laughs> a lot. Yeah, I said it was many, a lot. I, I'm definitely not going to list them all out, but I think some of the like most active ones are The Verge, Slashdot, and Lobsters. I actually don't subscribe to Hacker News at all because it's a big fire hose of stuff I don't usually care about. And I think the I personally prefer the signal to noise ratio that I get on with the Lobsters feed. I, I need to switch. I get, I kind of, it's not that I don't actually read the comments on it. Mm-hmm. So, but still, because I'm, I, I read the headlines specifically because of that agenda setting, like a media concept is a big thing. You know, who says it's not, it's, it's, it's the number one thing is what do I get served as information? Mm-hmm. Uh, it's, and because I don't actually go to the article, who writes the headline? It also matters a lot. And it is questionable whether or not I want the crowd at Hacker News have that kind of input into my brain. <laughs> it, that, that's the truth about anything, mm-hmm. right? So everybody, nobody, nobody, no journalists or no no one is uh, uh, objective or without any agenda or without any bias, right? They might attempt to be objective, but still, they are only human. So I should really probably take this more carefully because I get often annoyed when I scroll through the news and all I see is, uh, you know, kids of today can't do this anymore or uh, X and Y are considered harmful. You know, it's somebody basically, there's a lot of rants that go on mm-hmm. and it's a lot of rants about nothing important at all. Uh, well, it must be important to the people who wrote them, but it's not important to me. Yeah, I also do a lot of, uh, not a lot, probably not comparatively a lot, a lot at all, but I watch YouTube for news and I YouTube, watch YouTube for I don't know if tech news would be the case. I definitely don't watch YouTube for uh, like political news. Actually, that is not true. 
I just don't do it now because of the writer's strike in the United States, which uh, has been going on for what is five months now, and it effectively killed my uh, news source for the United States political news. Because I used to get all of this news about what's happening uh, in over there from uh, the likes of Stephen Colbert, Seth Meyers, you know, all, all my preferred uh, liberal bubble comedians. <laughs> Because if I have to listen to news, then comedy is my preferred medium, and uh, they are all they, they nobody they, they are not producing anything because the writers are all on strike now, and that was big for me. That would be like literally, yeah. I said I never sit down for I don't sit down for evening news anymore. But we used to would have we used to have this YouTube playlist of uh, of the whatever you call the shows. You know, the, is it the Daily Show or you know it's it's two or three comedians that do uh, liberal comedy uh, or political liberal comedy and they are funny and they, are, they have got high production value it's so po- polished you know it's uh, and close to my values after all so it, i i kind of like that well i really like that that's why i watch it every night well that's why i watched it every every night so that is no longer happening hopefully the 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 the, 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 the people who write these things will negotiate for themselves decent pay and other conditions soon and they will start producing my favorite comedy again but that's yeah so that's one thing and then on youtube i watch uh, for tech news or tech information because it's not really news as much like reviews i watch uh, uh, marquez brownlee mkbhd uh because part is like my job is uh, mobile devices and stuff like that so it's good to keep track of it and second, I just really like his style. Mm-hmm. Uh, he's chill and he's non-controversial, but he's not worried. He's not also afraid to say his opinion. So he doesn't have to be worried about pissing people off as long as he can back up his ideas or his right. whatever he says, right? And th- that that is good. And he has a really nice style and, you know, a bit of a Tesla fanboy, which, you know, but nobody's perfect. What do you do? watch any youtube but you probably watch watch a lot more youtube than i do i don't watch a ton i'm a, i'm subscribed to i'm quote unquote subscribed because i don't actually use the youtube web interface very much i have a script that uses youtube dl to download videos from the channels i like to watch and i am subscribed to some people maybe like 20 but they don't all upload super frequently and none of them have anything to do with news. It is exclusively entertainment. And I do, of course, listen to many podcasts and get news from these as well. I just watched, uh, before this, I watched the Linux Experiment, so I watch that for news. Sometimes I don't watch, uh, what is it called, This Week in Linux on YouTube. I listen to it on podcast, uh, because... I get, I actually, I used to listen to a lot more podcasts than I do now. And I run out, I run out of podcasts by, uh, let's say Tuesday or Wednesday. And the new, so there's new economist every Friday. And that's eight hours, usually eight, nine hours of audio. That's a lot. I listen at two, two speed, two half speed. <laughs> sure. 1.7x 1, 1. or whatever, right? So, and, uh, shortened gaps and all that stuff. So I listen to that and then, then, uh, yeah. I, I listened to This Week in Linux as well. Mm-hmm. Linux news, I used to basically swim in it. I used to surround myself by it and uh, submerge myself into it. But the thing is, it is not... Uh, like I did, There's less of it now. I don't know if that's even possible. Or I'm just... Uh, or it just got too, let's say, boring for me. Because it's not... It's, you know, it's... I don't know if you, well, I don't know. Basically, I, I think I, I've limited, uh, this year I kind of limited my Linux news sources. I narrowed it down to, to quite, to, by, by quite a few. And I think I'm not losing any important information is an interesting thing. Uh, I know late night Linux, uh, do news every, what was it like once every three episodes or something? I think so that as well. And obviously, uh, and that's it really. I'm all over the place today. I don't know, well, more than normally. It's all good. Oh, if you're ever looking for more feeds to follow, my entire list of 100 and whatever feeds are on my website, secluded.site slash feeds. You can poke around and see what you like. I'll link it in the show notes. I will export my uh, uh, XML, uh, my, my, my feed into an XML and uh, drop it somewhere and link it in the show notes. That will be interesting. I'm just thinking news. You know, news sounds like a big subject, mm-hmm. and we went through it fairly quickly. 
So you obviously read tech news. Mm-hmm. Do you concern yourself with politics at all or uh, sports news or not sports in the slightest? Um, politics sometimes, somewhat. I kind of, I guess you could say I get my political news through memes, which is terrible. <laughs> that's I, even better than my that's even better than my late night comedy to be honest i don't trust anything i read in memes but it's like hey there is something happening in this particular area that i might want to look into on my own unrelated to memes but <laughs> i'm in a couple i i follow a couple of meme like channels in telegram and before I go to bed or when I wake up or something, I just kind of scroll through them all. Most of them are funny. Some of them are more, like, political and concerning. But most of them are just funny memes. You know, the fact that you are two decades younger than me, it just, I've always, ever since emoji started being the thing, I always has this dread in the back of my head that our civilization, instead of being able to express ourselves in more simple things, is headed to expressing ourselves through pictures <laughs> and i'm yeah. just you know written language specifically i don't know any other so the written language as i know it you know european uh, languages at, at least as, as far as i know right are controllably expressive you can fairly easily say what you want and make sure that the person you are telling it or writing it to gets the message the way you intend it. As you know, some with, with, with a lot of caveats, but basically that's it. I can't read emoji very well. I do, I think uh, I think you must have uh, more empathy than I'm able to master to understand what people want to tell by them. And I don't, you know. And with memes, you have to have a lot of shared culture reference sometimes because a lot of them are. You know, they are taken from a movie, and mm-hmm. I've never seen that bloody movie. Don't know what the situation is. So, yeah, I just, uh, you know, good for you. I don't I don't think you're doing it wrong, but I'm just worried that if this is a trend and everybody's moving to communicating via emojis, memes, and uh, avatars, and all of these things, yeah, well, I hope that that if there is a, if this goes critical, and this is how we communicate now, well, I hope that I'll be dead before it happens. <laughs> Because I don't think I could live in a society, you know, I could function in a society that doesn't uh, use uh, letters anymore. I don't understand maybe 20 or 30 percent of the memes I see around because I'm I've been told by other Zoomers that I am a bad Zoomer. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear! Yeah, I've met. So we were. I'm part of a. Uh, I'm part of a Linux group, and we had a virtual meeting today. Mm-hmm. That's why I'm so. Uh, we had, uh, you know, I'm. I'm this time so talked out of uh, sense because I, I. I spent already three hours chatting to people, and that's more than I do in a month. Mm-hmm. Uh, I. Uh, we had a discussion about how the kids today don't understand file systems. Mm-hmm. That's how it started, right? Which. You know, I have a job in a tech company, so I don't get really affected by this because you would never get hired uh, if you didn't, uh, I think. Well, and that's the thing. I said for my specific team, member, for, for, for a member of my specific team, you should not actually necessarily need to know that, what a file system is. You know, if you if we were able to provide you with an app where through which you open everything you need to open and locate everything you need to locate, then the level of abstraction is fine. But anyway, we had a... Basically, the conversation that we had was how Zoomers who go for non-technical but yet professional jobs uh, suddenly cannot open a file on a computer because they don't have that. They never learned, you know, it, it doesn't exist on a phone. Well, you know, not unless you really want to. Mm-hmm. So yeah, you're not representative of your generation because you actually have a computer and know how to use it. Mm-hmm. So you you said that you get a lot of memes. That means means that you are getting social media news, basically. Yeah, which is why I don't trust it at all. <laughs> so that's the approach. So I surround myself willingly in a bubble. I tried doing it differently and it didn't work out. I'm not one that can basically say, well, I think this, that's why I should listen to people who think something the opposite. No, that doesn't work for me. So I surround myself in a Fediverse bubble. The news I get, I have to take it with a, not with a pinch of salt, because I get a lot of people who feel well, threatened by the Nazi right, right? And that they are all, uh, that that's basically my Fediverse. Mm-hmm. You basically just consume anything and don't trust any of it. Yeah. 
When it comes from memes, when it comes from like my RSS reader, I do put more stock in that because those are not necessarily proper journalistic outlets, but more proper than fucking memes. <laughs> what do you consider a proper journalistic outlet? I, well, the one that comes to the top of my mind is like Ars Technica. That is a fantastic source of technical news, I think. And also the register. I'm going to question you. Mm -hmm. Why these two? What makes them so, so fantastic and above the others? I don't know. I can't exactly put it into words. For, well, maybe I can a little bit. I guess one of the things that makes Ars Technica a more trusted source is because I am familiar with some of the writers who have worked there. And I trust them a great deal. And the fact that they worked there for a very long time indicates to me that the rest of the establishment is of a higher quality than others. I do often read the same news item across a couple of different news sources. Like, the, for example, both Ars Technica and The Register might report on a topic, and I read them both on both sites. Sometimes I prefer the context and the details that Ars Technica attaches to that news item, and sometimes I prefer the details and context that The Register attaches to it. But I, they're both... In my mind, I like I said, I can't exactly put it into words. I do hold both of those to a higher standard than many of the others. Okay, maybe the other way. So what makes The Verge, for example, not as high standard? If The Verge is not as high standard to you? It's not necessarily that it's of a lower quality. It's that these are hard questions. Sorry. These are good <laughs> questions. I'm throwing you some curveballs. So The Verge has some good technical opinion pieces, but they also have an absolutely massive crap ton of, like, the listical, basically spam, I think. Like, the best watches to buy in 20, January of 2023. Like, it, no. Some people might find that interesting. I don't care. Um, And there's just... A massive amount of that. The Verge, I, I opened it this morning, and I think The Verge had something like 300 feed items. And then as I was scrolling through every single one of them, I was just like, nope, nope, don't care, don't care. Annoying, that's noise. Please stop. I'm tired of this. Go away. <laughs> <laughs> yes, so it's interesting that you're saying, please stop, and it's you scrolling down. I know. <laughs> uh, we, do, we all do it. Uh, but... I think then, again, it's the signal-to-noise ratio. Mm -hmm. And and the register is very information-dense, where where basically what, what they focus on is literally the interesting bits, and they do give a lot of context. And they are funny. It's uh, not, you know, they, they have, they are a bit, I don't like things that take themselves too seriously. That's why I like The Economist, because you read, you read some other periodica, and it's uh, all... They are all a bit up to their own arses, mm -hmm. whereas, you know, the register, the economy, you know, they, they, they throw a little bit of a flair there. They, they, they basically, in the end, even if you read about some, like, let's say that you read about the next recession that's supposedly coming to Europe and we are going to unavoid unavoidably crash, crash and land, in the economies, they write about it in such a way that you at least chuckle. Mm -hmm. And that's important. You know, yeah, we are all screwed, but it's not the end of the world. Whereas if you read it in The Guardian, you're probably gonna, uh, I don't know, cry for a year. Uh, so anyway, so that's, that again is the, is the import, you, you know, it, we've, we've come into this a lot before, like you value your time and you go for the, for the places where that, that give you the information density and the high quality. Let's say you see in a meme that uh, something really personally, imp something that can affect you personally is happening in the political sphere and you have to get more information. It, don't tell me which exact period we would go to because that would probably reveal a lot about you. You might not want to do that. But would you go print? Would you go, would you go TV? Or would you go kind of cable TV? Or would you go the internet? Where would you get the most, you know, which medium, as in which format would you trust the most to get information from? 
on things that you don't personally understand. I would. I don't have cable TV, so I can't do that. Um, I don't know where I would get a newspaper, actually. But what I do is I just look it up in a search engine and find a website that I I recognize as being a news outlet, like CNN or NBC. These these are just ones off the top of my head. But then I know some of those are biased one way or another way. And then I'll, I I can't always remember which one is biased which way. So then I'll have to look that up really? <laughs> or ask a friend who I trust, who, who is more familiar with the uh, political news area. I'll ask them which one is biased which way, and then I'll look for the other one. And then I'll try to get both sides to, to see, to get a more unbiased view of what of that topic. I must have a very simple view of American broadcasting uh, corporations because I always thought there's three, well, there's one big one that's very right and two other smaller ones that are also right and the rest are the liberal ones in some way or another. But anyway, it doesn't matter. Uh, yeah, okay. So so you'd go to special, so you, you would go to what you deem to be professional media. Yes. Unlike, uh, let's say, you wouldn't go on Facebook or Reddit. Right. Nor would I go on the Fediverse. Yeah, I mean, that that would be, you know, yeah. That, uh, I don't know what I would, well, okay, so, why I'm asking, right? So, um, I've never finished this, but I've studied journalism in my misspent youth. And uh, it was in, I started, actually, I had induction on uh, the 11th of September 2001. And that basically... Uh, the, 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 that event permeated my entire studies because it was obviously big for, for many, many, from many different points. It basically it is the turn of the millennium thing, one of the, one of the biggest events, but it was also huge for journalism. But what, and what kind of stuck with me, it was, um, by 2001, Czech Republic already had, the Czech Republic already had, uh, over a decade of democracy and, uh, free media and commercial media. And when uh, when September 11 happened, suddenly all the newspapers that normally outsell broadsheets uh, 100 to 1 were stuck on the shelves and people were just grabbing the more serious media. You know, mm-hmm. it's like in uh, which which is an and I wonder if that would still happen because a lot of has a lot has changed since then. And I don't know what I would do if there was like an event. Where would I? go and uh, grab the most uh, I might go on Telegram probably actually because I'm thinking first thing ask somebody who might know right mm-hmm. somebody I know from from real life yes and that might be yeah I think that would be my por- f- first port of call rather than and you know then the official media mm-hmm. because obviously gathering in you know power of gathering in information but yeah So, Amolif, you've recently switched uh, careers, can I say that? Uh, You are now... Not exactly. I I wouldn't say I've switched. More, I am... So, I have have my own business with uh, a set of clients, and I'm dialing my current primary client back and dialing another client up. And the goal is to be half-time for both of them, at least for the foreseeable future. Um, The new client is actually JMP, which is they provide you with a phone number that you can receive calls and texts to using like traditional telephony, voice calls, SMS, MMS, and they translate all of that into XMPP. So I get an iMessage-like experience without being in the Apple ecosystem. Heresy. (laughs) It's really convenient. I'd, I'd been a customer for, I don't know, two years, something like that over two years, because I think I first subscribed back in 2021 or something. Um, And I've always been extremely impressed with the service quality and customer support and how they interact with their upstream open source projects, because the business is built entirely on open source software. When necessary, they fork a project and make their own changes to it, but they often try to submit those their improvements back to the upstream project so everyone gets to benefit. Sometimes their patches are rejected. Sometimes upstream does not want those features, and fair enough. But they've 
I think they're really good actors in the open source ecosystem. So I was, I reached out, asked if they were hiring. They said, sure. And literally two days later, they said, okay, you start next month. Well, this is that next month. Oh, very nice. It was really cool. Congratulations. I hear you need to learn some more esoteric programming languages uh, <laughs> for your new position. Mm-hmm. So a lot of their backend software is Ruby and Haskell. And I know basically no Ruby and very, very, very little Haskell. I've, I'm going through the book, Learn You a Haskell for Great Good. And I think I'm on uh, chapter three or something. But they're both really interesting programming languages. Have you ever worked with either of them? No, well, I tried to learn from a book. I tried to learn Ruby on Rails, but uh, that's more, or at least the way the book was selling it, it was more kind of a configuration exercise uh, because you set up the scaffolding and everything and you get basically, basically was showing you how to get the working, um, working uh, web application uh, as fast as possible. And for Haskell, no. Uh, closest I get to it, well, not close, I never got close to it, but my Dad tried it for a while, but he has a back, his background is maths. So, uh, how's your maths? Uh, not not super great, but from what I understand, Haskell doesn't require a massive amount of like calculus or that that kind of stuff. I always imagine, uh, you know, a professor with a chalk at a, at a chalkboard <laughs> writing Haskell on the chalkboard, uh, but. So, so, so is there anything, I know you have to learn these languages, but do you know any kind of, why, why would one want to learn any of them if one didn't have to? From what I remember, Ruby is a weakly typed language, kind of like JavaScript, but I've heard a lot of people describe it as the most productive programming language for developers. It was designed to have as pleasant a developer experience as possible. And by extension, I've heard a lot of people say that Ruby on Rails, which is a, a Ruby framework, I've heard people say that it's the most pleasant framework and language to use for any kind of web development. I don't have personal experience with any of that. I've also heard people say Ruby sucks and they hate writing it, but <laughs> I'll be able to make that determination for myself as, as I go forward learning it and, and writing it and stuff. The way I think about it is like Python with uh, in, using OOP and uh, descending from sm- descended from Smalltalk. Yes, Ruby was influenced by like Perl, Smalltalk, and Java and Lisp. Ruby does definitely have object oriented like features and and principles, but unless I'm mistaken, and I very well could be, it also it, it supports multiple programming paradigms. It can be object oriented. It can be procedural. And so Ruby is pleasant. And what about Haskell? Haskell is performant. So it's a strongly typed compiled language and it, and it's a purely functional programming language. So for example, you don't have loops at all. In place of loops, you have to use recursion. And that's a difficult concept for some people to grasp while they're learning the language. But tools like Pandoc are written in Haskell. That's part of what makes them so super performant at converting between different data structures and, and, and languages. And I think, I know GitHub's like syntax highlighting system, the back end for that is also in Haskell, which is pretty cool. So you will, you basically need to learn both of these. And how long do you think you have before you become confident in, in, uh, both of them. Oh, it'll be a couple of years. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna stumble my way around for a while before I get comfortable. <laughs> Another thing about Haskell that I've heard about a lot but haven't experienced or worked with yet are monads. Do you know what those are? Well, actually, no, because I I I know they are a concept in like is it Kantian philosophy, but I don't know what they mean in Haskell. So it's a structure that combines functions and wraps their return values in a type with additional computation. I don't know what that means. <laughs> That's the Wikipedia page <laughs> for Monad functional programming. <laughs> Another really cool thing about Haskell is that it uses lazy evaluation. Are you familiar with that? All right. So 
like in uh, in iterators in Python, basically, if you if you just leave it be, it doesn't get evaluated until you want to access it. From what I remember, all of Haskell is lazily evaluated. So if you want to display the result of a computation in a terminal, that computation won't actually occur until you call that print function. If you say like uh, x equals uh, 12 plus 9, and then print x, for example, that computation won't occur until that print function is called. And that applies to all of Haskell. Nothing is evaluated until it actually needs to be used. And that allows the compiler to do some really cool things about performance optimization. I think that about wraps us up for this episode. If you have any questions, comments, feedback, or topic ideas, those would be very welcome. You can write into show at linuxlads.com or go to linuxlads.com slash contact for all the places to find us. Well, it was good to talk to you, Mike, and we'll be back in two weeks with another episode. Pleasure to talk to you too, and uh, see ya. Adios. As always, I've been Omelith. What? We don't say I've been on this show. Oh, some other show right, right, right. Okay. <laughs>